first of all, thanks everyone for taking the time to come. Um, I'm always shocked and surprised that this kind of stuff isn't mandatory because as coaches and parents, what are we always telling our kids? If you don't go the extra mile, if you're not going to put in the extra work, if you're not going to put the work you need in to be better, how are you going to get better? But we are really good at telling our kids that, but we kind of don't do it ourselves. And so I'm really happy to see that you guys have all taken the opportunity to do that because I think uh, any little bit of knowledge that you can glean is going to be better. You're going to be a better coach, better parent, uh, better official, better administrator, better anything. My goal is to help you take something away. I'm not a fan of warm shower summits where you get all this fancy information, go back to doing what you were doing. I really want to support you in taking one thing away. So here's how I work is this is not an education or a lecture. This is engagement. So I'm going to talk for 20 minutes, then we're going to have a Q&A, then we're going to watch the video, then have a Q&A because I'm here to answer your questions, not impart all my stuff on you. Good? And since it's a small, intimate room, it's going to be really hard for you to be checking your cell phones and doing things because I'm right here so I can see you and I have no problem calling people out and, answer, and asking questions. So we're going to keep it light, we're going to keep it fun, and we're going to move. First thing uh, that we're going to get into is a little bit of an overview of who I am. So we'll start off with a little bit of an overview about my history. I'll start off by saying I'm a lifelong learner. And the older I get, the more I realize, the less I know. Um, I have had lots of opportunity in the sports sector in terms of um, dealing with organizations from the local sport organizations right through to the International Olympic Federations. Uh, I got an opportunity to speak at the first annual ADM with the United States Olympic Committee addressing youth sport. Uh, I had the opportunity to go to Norway after they basically won the Olympics and sit down with 26 sport federations because their concern was what are we going to do next? How are we going to stay ahead of the game? And I've had the opportunity to work with organizations like the NHL and the PGA as well. So at the top end, I, I, I'm very uh, understanding of what's going on. All this stuff is just stuff. Um, the important thing is I'm a father. Uh, I've been an administrator. I've been an official. I've been a coach. So I can put myself and, and know some of the things that you're going through and speak to that. I've got over 25,000 hours of coaching one-on-one. -on -one, coaching coaches and, and coaching kids. So if you need to know anything about coaching that you want to know, please don't hesitate to ask. So first thing we're going to talk about is change. We're going to talk about change in the context of everyone wants to change, but nobody wants to change. Um, change is hard. That's why we don't do it. We always abide by the eight most dangerous rules in sport because that's the way we've always done things. And that's why we're in the position that we're in with a lot of struggles that we were seeing that are happening in sport. But the saying is, if you dislike change, you're going to dislike irrelevance even more. So couldn't be better time to talk about this because two things that are up on the screen here. Number one, the NCAA. Not sure if anybody understands or knows about the image and likeness laws that have been passed. Now in the NCAA where uh, US athletes, whether D1, D2, D3, are going to be actually able to be paid for their image and likeness. And that's going to completely transform the sport landscape. It's going to have massive effects on Canada because we're probably not going to think about how to deal with it until after it happens and nobody's left here. Um, so hopefully we can get ahead of that game and basically the NCAA put their foot down and said no we're not changing because this is the way we've always done it. So then California passed a state law that said we're changing in two, in two years and we're going to have all of our athletes paid. Then Michigan followed, the state of Michigan followed suit and now all the other states are following suit because as a competitive advantage, if I can go to a school in California and get paid, how, where do you think I'm going to go and play sports? So now the NCAA has to follow up. So that's a good example of change. Obviously, NHL, whoever's been, if you've been listening in the news, they're having their own Me Too movement in terms of the old school of coaching and that not working for people. The abuse, the, well, I'm just trying to toughen the kids up. That doesn't fly anymore. Uh, we're in a new era. We're in a new age of kids. Whether we like it or not, whether we want to criticize it or not, it's here. So we've got two choices. We can either deal with it or we can suffer the ramifications of not dealing with it. So change is important. That's going to underpin a lot of the things that we talk about today. So first thing I want to get into is what's happening. I want to share with you all what's happening globally in terms of sport landscape because it affects everyone as a parent or anything. So there's kind of, you know, seven main factors that are affecting youth sport participation. Number one being lack of free play. So lack of free play, zero to five years old. Uh, parents are taking their kids everywhere. We've got technologies, we've got screen. Kids aren't going outside and they're not exploring on their own. And not only is that a disadvantage from a physical perspective, but from a, uh, an emotional and mental perspective, kids can't develop the neural synapses for decision making, problem solving, etc. So we're seeing that 
come to fruition as they move on in their older ages. So lack of free play is huge from zero to five. That gives way to the second issue, which is the lack of fundamental movement skills. Running, jumping, kicking, catching, two-handed striking. We're now getting kids that come into fundamental sports skills without the foundational elements of movement patterns. And that's really dangerous because they don't feel like they have the confidence or competence to get into sports at all. So it's something that we have to consider and it's something that's gonna affect all of us no matter what we're doing and no matter what we're, we're in charge of. Marginalization of physical education. So phys ed now is Matt gets an A because he can run around faster than everyone else or at least it gets a three out of four because she's super social. It has nothing to do with someone's progression from I started here when I was throwing and now when I get reevaluated, I've actually moved to a proficient stage of competency. So that's having a big effect. Then we've got the technology. Obviously everyone knows about the iPhones and everyone knows that the average time spent on recreational iPhone time is seven hours a day, seven hours a day. Think about what that time used to be spent on, which would be discovery. I didn't grow up at a time where we had 352 channels. We had three. It was the Muppets. It was, uh, you know, Three's Company or it was CBC. Um, but now it's a reality. It's a reality of what we're doing. So we have to embrace that reality. How do we use technology to meet the kids where they are and get them engaged in what we want to get them engaged with, which is a positive uh, sport experience. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put in a little caveat here. I am 100% athlete focused and centered. I might say something that could offend anyone in the room because I am 100% athlete focused and centered. Please don't take it personally. I don't know what any of you do, so I'm not commenting on what you might be doing or not doing. So that's just a little sidebar. Early sports specialization and the professionalization of sport. Everyone knows that that's, that's a big issue. We're going to talk about that later. We're going we're gonna to look at it in the film. Yes? Can I ask what athlete focused and centered means? Athlete centric, which means athlete centric to me. It means something different to everybody, but it means that everything that we do should be in the best interest of the athlete's development. So it's not about the wins, it's not about the association, it's not about the banner. It's about that young man or woman's development from where they started to where they finish, where they choose to finish, whether it's a high performance or recreational pathway, or they want to get into officiating or whatever it is. We have to create athlete-focused and athlete-centric environments. Good? Good question. And ask any question at any time. Um, it's not fun. So it's not fun, obviously, if we're making sport like a part-time job for people. Um, I've known it. I've seen it. I've lived it. I did it. I was that dad that fell into the trap of we got to have spring hockey. I did it one year and said we're never doing this again. This doesn't make sense at all. And obviously that gives way to rising costs. So we got a pay-for-play system now. Some of our athletes, just because they get to the higher performance levels, are not necessarily the best athletes. They're the athletes that could pay to go to the showcases and be seen by everybody else. So nothing that we all don't know, but just really want to hit that. Again, generalizing. So uh, nothing that I say here is super specific and directed at anyone, but these are just general sport trends. And again, we've worked with countries all around the world, Stamps, Germany, Liechtenstein, uh, Switzerland, Canada, US, etc. So that's a common theme. The four tenets of quality sport management. So in our work with the PGA, we have uncovered four tenets of quality sport management. First tenet of quality sport management is organizational alignment. So organizational alignment is, is our vision and mission from the top down. And I think we all probably know in Canada, we've got national sport organizations at the top, provincial sport organizations, and then we've got a whole host of regional management like Pacific Sport, and then we've got the local community sport organizations. There's no alignment. So there's no alignment with what's going on from top to bottom, pretty much in any sport. We've talked to them all. Nobody disagrees. Um, that's an opportunity. So the opportunity when I talk about alignment is what does the national organization want? What is the role? What do they stand for? We're going to talk about that coming up. But is that filtering all the way down to the bottom? So if the NHL releases a declaration of principles, is that what we're seeing when we go to the ice? Are we seeing what they're espousing on the ice and on the ice level, and nine times out of 10, no, we're not. So how can we do better? So organizational alignment can also go laterally. So horizontally within your organization and laterally. Why isn't every single sport organization in this room right now? Why isn't there a representative from every sport organization in this room trying to get better, trying to work with the other sport organizations instead of what we see happening is everybody in their intellectual silos trying to grab the person, grab the kid, and keep them in their sport for as long as possible. So I know it's busy, and everyone's a busy time. Thursday, there's always a reason, but 
Again, I go back to the beginning of the conversation. <coughs> if what we're telling our kids is, if you want to get to that next level, you've got to put in the extra work, why aren't, we, why aren't we walking our own talk? Second tenant of quality sport management, discipline project management. It's one thing to fly in the expert, and the expert is usually the guy or gal without a from out of town with the accent and fancy slideshows, and they give you the big speech, you get all excited, it's like drinking a big gulp of Coke, and then you go back to doing what you're doing, and it's ugh. Okay, so you need discipline project management. How are you going to take some of the things that we talk about tonight and go back and implement them one step at a time? Take something, one thing, start with one thing and implement it in your organization. You need discipline project management. We've been those people that people call and say, can you come and give the talk? Sure, we can come and give the talk, but if you've got nobody on the other end to make sure it's being delivered, it's just a talk. We need to move away from information and education towards activation and accountability to quality sport processes and experience. Third tenant of quality sport management is stakeholder connectivity. So who are the stakeholders in sports? Who's, who is it? Athletes. Athletes one? Yep. Who else? Coaches. Coaches? Parents. Different table. Parents. Parents? Sponsors. Sponsors? Kids. Yep. Athletes? Who else? There's six key stakeholders. Administrators, absolutely. Organizations. Thank you, officials. We, all, we always forget the officials, right? No, no officials, no games, right? And then the educators. So whether the educators are the trainers, whether they're the physical, t physical education educators, whether the rec center, those are the six stakeholders that are involved in youth sport experiences in every community. If they're not on the same page, if they don't have visibility to what's going on, if they're not rowing in the same direction, how do we stand to create those quality sport experiences for kids. And then the last tenant is the integrated operating environment. How does that all work together? But these are the big six. And as you can see, we have most people say, well, you know, if we go to a room and we say, what's the problem with youth sports? Who, what stakeholder is causing the biggest problem? Nine, nine out of 10 people will say parents. Oh, parents are crazy. Parents are crazy. And, and <coughs> our response to that is, are they? Are they all crazy? Are they all crazy? Or just have we not done a good job engaging them? Because parents, in my mind, are secondary consumers. They're the ones that are spending the money. Who does the best job of engaging parents in the world? Disney. Disney. They set the standard. Nobody ever shows up to Disney with their kid and is greeted by someone that says, hey, I'll take your kids. You go sit over there and shut up. you got a 24-hour rule. We're going to take your kids on all the rides. And when we're finished, we'll come back and you can take them, okay? And this is how it's going to roll. Nobody ever does that. But we do that in sport. We do that in sport because we don't realize that it's a service. We don't realize it's athlete-centric and athlete-focused. And we start m making the mistake that it's about something else. When it's not, it's about the kids and what the kids want. And what do kids want? We know what kids want because there's been studies done. So we call them the five Fs. Fun, friends, fair play, friendly competition, finish the season better than they started. They don't say development. They say they just want to finish with new skills. So, f sorry, five Fs, five Fs. Fun, friends, fair play, friendly competition, finish the season better than they started. It's been studied, it's not Matt's opinion. That's what they want. So how, in each interaction that we have with them, how do we make sure that that's what they want? And that's what we do now. We work with sport organizations on how to operationalize long-term athlete development in their clubs. There's a step-by-step -step process that we've developed, and if you follow it, you get the results. And the results aren't just the wins. The results are the buy-in. The results are the engagement. The results are good sport experiences. That's what we do. So those are the tenets of quality sport management. So when we go back to organizational alignment, we talked about the different roles. LSO, PSO, NSO. A little bit hard to see, but you know, here you got the, the international sport organizations, so the Olympics. Then you got the NSOs. What's the NSO's job? Does anyone know what the NSO's job is? National sport organization. Standards. Yep, exactly. And what else? Enforce. What do they do really well? Don't say enforce. Because <laughs> they do not enforce anything. <laughs> what, what else do they do? So, so I come from a business background. So I look at the sport infrastructure like a franchise business. And I look at the NSOs as the franchisor. So the franchisor, is, their job is to create the operating manual. We, we create the operating manual based on evidence, based on best practice, based on science, based on knowledge, based on everything. That's the job of a franchisor. And our other job is to go out and make sure we are 
giving the franchisees top, top dollar in terms of advertising, in terms of people seeing us. So NSOs are sports. They put on sporting events because the sporting events get the money, get the visibility, and get all that cachet that you need that trickles down to say, yes, this sport is watchable. Look what's happening on TV. That's their job. What are provincial sport organizations? In my estimation, they're regional managers. So in a business structure, the job of a PSO is to be the regional manager for that NSO. Their job is to make sure that the franchisees, which is a local community organization, LSOs, are operating in compliance, are fully supported, are doing things as they should, and have all the tools and, and, and resources they need to succeed. So that's how I view that. So when you look at how that rolls, and, and if anyone has any other uh, opinions, feel, please, please feel free. Um, but when you look at how that rolls, you can say, you know, do we understand what the ecosystem is? Because when we hear problems, what do we see? We see everyone pointing, that's not us. That's not what we do. The local community organization, they've got the six stakeholders. So even if there's no organizational alignment from NSO to PSO to LSO, even if that doesn't exist, it doesn't mean that your local community can't have alignment with parents, athletes, coaches, officials, and have everyone on the same page. That's your job. You can start that alignment right there. As a PSO, you can start that alignment at that level. You don't have to wait for anyone else. You don't have to blame anyone else. So again, at the center of all this is the athlete. And we lose that. We keep losing that. And we're hearing it in the media more and more and more and more. It's not, it's not become athlete-centered. And again, are we walking our talk? Are we walking our talk? Rhetorical question. We have to ask ourselves that and keep ourselves in check. John Maxwell wrote a book called Leadership. Really good book. Obviously on leadership. Um, and what he said was he gave the 25-50-25 rule. So 25 people... 25% of the people that you talk to will buy into the message. Yep, yep, I got, I got it. This is good. I like where this is going. 50% will be undecided. I don't know about this guy. And 25% you couldn't taser into believing and changing their behavior. But who do we spend the most amount of time trying to onboard? The bottom 25. It's like the caboose. Take the pin, pull it, cut them loose. If the parent doesn't want to comply to something that you're putting forward for the right reasons because it's athlete-centric, then that parent should have the opportunity to go somewhere else and do something else. Why do we keep trying to convince, cajole, and onboard people who just do not want to be on board and do not want to change? Um, so again, John Maxwell, and that's a, good, uh, a really good one. So what's changing? So what, what's the good stuff? What's the good news? Well, there's a renewed focus on age and stage appropriate athlete development. So we're no longer looking at just the technical tactical. So if we break down the athlete development sphere, there's kind of five main areas. Competence, which is the physical abilities and the technical tactical abilities. So can I dribble, stick handle, uh, jockey a ball in lacrosse? Can I do all those technical tactical skills? Am I fast, speed, strength, endurance? Can I do all that stuff? That's competence. Then confidence. So that's kind of the mental psychological. Do I believe in myself? Self-resilience, trust and training, all of those aspects. Then there's character, so that's the leadership development. Game sense, leadership, attitude, work ethic. Then there's connection, which is the social emotional aspects. Relationship with teammates, am I having fun? Doing the right things. Do I understand social media? Do I understand sports nutrition, sickness and health? And then there's culture, so vision, mission, values, goals and objectives. So these five things need to be in play to create an athlete-centered quality sport experience. And when we got into the coaching phase, what did we see? We saw the same thing you guys probably saw. 99% of all the coaches were focused on one of these pillars, which was competence. And of those, so if, we, if this is 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, and we broke it down to four, 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 it was about the physical and the technical tactical. We didn't focus on the sleep, rest, and recovery. We weren't paying any attention to nutrition. And the rehab and prehab was not even something that most people were considering. So if you look at that quality sport experience and you break it into 100%, 99% of organizations are catering to 8% of a quality sport experience. Is that a pass? So nothing but opportunity. Nothing but opportunity. One of the things that we do is say, help coaches and help organizations, how do I infuse confidence, character? How do I focus on those aspects of development as well as the competence aspect of development? Because 
the mind starts, and it all starts with the mind. And this isn't hocus pocus, po hocus pocus or zen or anything like that. You know, what organizations and what sports do the best job at this? Does anyone know? Can anyone guess? Not you, Elisa. Can anyone else guess? A jiu-jitsu martial arts. Just because of the culture of those sports. The very culture of those sports lends itself to the development of all of the, and the focus on all of these things. So, nothing but opportunity. And, and again, you'll get that slide and just keep that in your mind. Keep that in your mind. What are we doing to develop those other areas of the, of the whole person? How are we developing the athletes? Because okay, 2% are going to make it to the elite levels. 2%. Do we know how low 2% is? It's really, really, really low. And guess what those 2% don't need? Any of us. Because they are on a predetermined path. We're going to talk about that in a second. What does elite mean? Unfortunately, politics, policies, and procedures have trumped people. So the focus, we asked 20 executive directors, where do you spend the most amount of your time? Can you break it down to us in terms of time allocation? 50% on politics and bureaucracy. 50% of time. 30% on policies and procedures because they're dealing with the policy and bureaucracy. 10% on people. 10% on product enhancement. I'm not even going to insult anyone in this room and ask them what's wrong with that. It's completely backwards. We are reactive. And, and society is reactive. We know that. We don't start fundraising for grandma's illness until she's ill. We don't start doing the bottle drive for our weekend tournament until the week before. We're reactive. And this is what's happened in the sport, the sport scene. We're reacting. All these policies and procedures and politics are a result of not having a strong vision, mission, leadership, and values on the front end. So we're dealing with all of the stuff that comes from that on the back end. We need to be 50% focused on the people. We need to be 30% focused on the, on the product development and enhancement, which is what all of you are doing here tonight. And then we need to do 10% on the policies, procedures, and nonsense, because we won't have to work with, we won't have to deal with that. The saying is people do what's inspected, not what's expected. So we really have to get serious with what we're tracking, because what gets measured becomes what matters. And what are we really good at measuring in the youth sports sector? The standings, the schedule, and the score. And that's what it becomes. The, the schedule, the standings, and the score. What gets measured becomes what matters. We don't need more information in education. We need activation and accountability. We don't need another PDF that gets trickled down, that sits on the shelf, that says this is uh, Athlete Development Matrix 3.0. Make sure you embed it. We need the activation and accountability to the things that we already know we're supposed to be doing. And we must provide the what, why, who, when, where, how, if we want sustainable change. So we always, our advice to any sport organizations is, listen, if you really want something, don't let anything leave your desk unless you have covered off the why, why you're doing it, starting with why, Simon Sinek, then the what, then the how, the who, the when, and the where. Nothing leaves your desk, because otherwise you're just giving more information and education with no mechanisms to activate anything. And that's not going to help us get from where we are to where we want to be. Two great books by David Epstein. Not sure if anyone's had a chance to read them. If you hadn't, very good. One's called Range and one's called The Sports Gene. It has to do with elite level performance. Here's the breakdown of elite level performance. When we asked a whole bunch of sport experts from around the world, what, what is elite level performance? 40% genetic predisposition. Because you know what? I'm not going to ever play in the NBA. I don't care how good I am. I'm likely not going to play in the NBA because I am not six foot eight with a wingspan of six feet and uh, a, a genetic god. I'm just not. So genetic predisposition, and again, I'm generalizing. Of course, anyone can do anything, but more by and large. You know, volleyball used to be a great sport. I used to love it. I would never even get near a volleyball court right now because, again, I'm not seven feet. So genetic predisposition, 40%. 30%. Internal drive. So 30% of elite athlete performance comes from within that athlete. So again, the best thing we can do for that athlete is get out of their way, not get in their way. Elite level athletes, and I know a lot, they're the, you didn't have to tell them what to do. They were just doing it. And when pe people say, hey, listen, how do I know if my kid's elite? My answer is, if you're asking me, they're probably not. But if you want to know, if your kid on their own accord of their own volition is eating, sleeping, breathing a particular sport uh, every single day over vaping, 
texting, hanging out with friends, boozing, and doing all that stuff on their own accord, then probably, maybe, they're suited for a, a specialized pathway. And there's nothing wrong with a specialized pathway for that particular kid. Um, but that is the self-determining prerequisite for the elite club. And if your kid enjoys fun, friends, fair play, friendly competition, finishing the season better, hanging out with their friends, partying on the weekend, uh, doing all the stuff that kids do, then more, most likely they're destined to the 98%, which is the participation level. And in our, all of our work, great work that's been done by Canada, especially in the long-term athlete development, we do a fantastic job of the high-performance pathway. We do a terrible job of the participation pathway. So that's a great opportunity for us. David Epstein wrote about it, range. So he compared um, Federer and Tiger, two different people. Uh, Roger didn't start playing tennis until he was eight, or sorry, 20, uh, seriously. Tiger Woods is balancing on his dad's hand when he was two and winning tournaments when he was four. Um, basically, more well-rounded. How many kids are, are, are going to get to that elite level? It's 2%. So why drill that into everybody? Let them decide. Get out of their way. Just provide the platform for them to be there. And then the sports gene. Why? The NFL, uh, there's no white corners because their hips are smaller. So African-American corners can swivel faster and keep up with receivers. There's nothing you can do about that. That is the sports gene. So you can try as hard as you want, but genetically you're not predisposed to that. That's an example. So. If elite level performance is 40% genetic predisposition, 30% internal drive, 10% luck, 10% coaching, and 10% the environment, we have to understand we're not as important as we think we are. And those numbers aren't, don't take those numbers for actual, that was just our little study, but by and large, the point of this is, is more is out of our control than we like to think. So that's elite level performance. So let's recap this and then we'll open up for questions. Quality sport management focus, we need to change that. Okay, so we need to be prioritized people. Secondly, we need to understand that elite level performance, we need to maintain the perspective. And we need to help parents and kids maintain that perspective. Absolutely we want to put them in, the, in, in a great environment. Our saying is as many as possible, as long as possible, in the best environments possible. And then just let's see what happens. Let them see what happens. We want more kids experiencing more things on a daily basis. I know I'm not saying anything to any of you that you don't agree with and that you're not trying to do on your own. And lastly is we've got to develop the whole person. Because again, to your point about society and having contributing members of society, that's what this is. Youth sport, to me, is a dress rehearsal for life where you're going to learn everything, winning, losing, communication, feedback, teammates, criticism, and in, and basically it's gonna teach you in a supported environment where after the game you can just go do something else, you learn how to process that stuff. Instead of just having it later and later and later with no team sports, getting coddled, getting to the job, get the real feedback, and now we're wondering why we've got all these mental health issues. I'm not saying that's the only reason, I'm saying it is definitely a contributing factor. So we have to understand what is the point of all this. Okay, community sports, in my estimation, was designed to bring the communities together and people together, meet new people, meet new families, have fun, socialize, do all that stuff. What's happening now? It's actually pulling the communities apart. I'm your neighbor. Your kid makes the elite team. My kid's not on the elite team. My kid goes, why, why is Johnny or Jenny on the elite team? Well, her mom, she knows this guy. Don't, it's so stupid. And now we don't talk to each other. That, like, what are we doing? What are we doing? Right? Let's create good environments, quality sport environments. Okay, so that is, again, bringing it back to the beginning. Change. Okay, everyone wants change. Nobody wants to change. We go out of here and we go, hey, I heard this great thing or I've, I got this book. It would be perfect for somebody else. I, I was thinking about you. It's perfect for somebody else. No, no, like we have to embrace it. That's, that's ours to own and change first. Um, change is going to happen whether we like it or not. And it's happening so fast now that if we don't, at least, we're not, even, we're not even keeping up, let alone being in front of it. And if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even more. We have to understand, and I know there's a lot of people in here from a lot of, usually when we have these conferences, it's usually representatives from what I would call the fringe sports, because the hockey is like, oh, we, got, we don't need to listen to this, and soccer, we got lots of kids. It's usually the fringe sports that come together, that get together, that cooperate, that share the kids, that come up with strategies because 
really they're sick and tired of getting the kids pillaged and not and not engaging in those sports which are great sports we should be not railroading and funneling the kids into the popular sports we should be exposing kids to all sports and letting them choose and supporting their choice in, in having a great experience with any sport they have.